Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another USC, US China Institute webinar. We're lucky today because we have Professor Ben Lee who will join us in raising questions. Uh, ben is Professor of Communication here at the USC Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism, and he heads the school's graduate program in communication management. And of course, in communication management, one of the things that uh, these students do uh, is that they look at cultural industries, they explore new tech, and look at how stories are told, received, adjusted, all of that sort of thing. Today, of course, we're looking at China's Belt and Road Initiative. And everybody, of course, has heard uh, quite a lot about the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, you've heard stories from China, you've heard stories from outside China, you've heard stories from the Belt and Road. We've hosted a number of programs looking at it, including issues regarding governance and sovereignty. We've looked at uh, the question about the regional power that China may be accumulating through its efforts in Southeast Asia, building rail networks. We've also looked at the environmental impact some of these projects are having and the issues that that generates. And of course, we've looked at the interplay between the Belt and Road Initiative and the domestic political, economic, and social scene within China. But today, we're going to be looking at China's communication efforts regarding the initiative. What stories has it told? How have those stories been conveyed? How have they been received? How has China used history as part of this narrative? And we are so fortunate to have with us today Professor Carolyn Van Nort from the University of West Scotland, who has written a great new book on the subject, on China's communication regarding the Belt and Road Initiative. Professor Van Nort uh, has uh, been teaching at the University of West, West Scotland for, uh, I guess, about three years now. She is maybe the most global speaker we've ever had with us. Uh, she's a native of the Netherlands. Uh, she earned her doctorate uh, in New Zealand. She wrote a dissertation on not just China, but the other BRIC countries, looking at Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. She earned degrees not just in the Netherlands, but also in Spain. She studied in China. She's uh, studied in Brazil, Canada, and the United States. And she has experience as a media practitioner uh, working in new media uh, you know, for, for a corporation. She's also been uh, involved in telling stories to attract tourists and this sort of thing. She works at the intersection between policy, public policy, and communication. And uh, she just earned her degree uh, in 2018, but this is already her second book. Uh, her first book, Infrastructure Communication in International Relations, is obviously tied to some of the ground we're going to cover uh, with her today. But her new book on China's Belt and Road, the communication associated with it, actually is the first book in a new series from Routledge. And uh, they must be very happy indeed to have uh, Dr. Van Nort's book launching the series. So, Professor Van Nort, if you would like to, please take it away. Well, thank you, everyone, for uh, attending this uh, book talk. Um, I'm very happy that all of you um, uh, took time uh, out of your very busy days. So, um, uh, today I'd like to talk about my new book, but as um, Clay already um, uh, mentioned, I'd like to draw your attention to another book um, that I've been writing uh, and uh, just uh, was actually published only earlier this year. And it's titled Infrastructure Communication in International Relations. And as the title suggests, I argue that communication about infrastructure matters in international relations. It is useful to look at this infrastructure to get an idea of 
um, uh, why these projects matter, uh, why actors are engaged in this, um, what kind of image uh, does an actor as a government um, want to um, uh, convey while they're engaging, while they're financing, while they're putting aid in such infrastructure projects. And um, I've been uh, using various uh, case studies, looking at the BRICS, uh, looking at Brazil and uh, at the Belt and Road also in this book. But um, it, so the, the next book is actually uh, therefore an, uh, um, a continuation of this book. But in many ways, I already said in this particular book, uh, infrastructure uh, communication matters. And yes, infrastructure, obviously, the cement is still is very important. But by looking at the communication itself, um, we learn a lot of new things. So let's move on uh, to, I would say, uh, what is probably uh, the most uh, biggest infrastructure in the uh, biggest infrastructure initiative in the 21st century, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative. And I wanted to look specifically at how China communicates about them, about the projects. Now, I just put, uh, put two images out there and you probably already have an idea of like, oh yeah, yeah, this is about the Belt and Road. So on the one hand, on the left side, you see an image of a Belt and Road project. Maybe you're familiar with this one, maybe not, but this is uh, the China-Maldives Friendship Bridge in, in the Maldives. And in many ways, uh, you see China communicating um, real images uh, of the infrastructure itself. On the other hand, um, you see images of the Silk Road. Um, and this is because, uh, as you're probably aware, China is trying to revive the Silk Road and um, Chinese authorities try to associate their idea of international order with broad-based values that will have global efficacy and associating the Silk Road with you know, both the positive aspects such as trade, connectivity, peace, friendship, things like that. So these two dimensions I find very interesting. So in part, it's about communication about the project itself. And on the other hand, you have communications um, about the Silk Road. And this historical imagery is used to stabilize and historicize, historicize relations with BRI partners. Um, so let's have these two images in our minds. So, so based on these two images, I asked uh, myself, in the book, um, how does China narrate about infrastructure to create a shared meaning about Belt and Road infrastructure projects? And second, how does China apply representations of the past to revive the Silk Road? Um, to answer these questions, I've been conducting visual and qualitative narrative analysis of media productions by CGTN and Xinhua News on uh, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook in 2018 and 2019. Now, the aim of um, this particular analysis is looking at the narrative formation. So, so what is projected? How is this image constructed? How are, uh, is, so how, is the, how are the narratives formed? So really looking at the image itself. Now, what I argue in this book um, is that, 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 yes, so there are the two aspects, <laughs> uh, infrastructure narratives and Silk Road narratives, and they have two different objectives. So on the one hand, you would say that China communicates infrastructure narratives to advance its international image as infrastructure and standard setting power. And infrastructure power, as I relate to, to the theory in my book, is the ability of a state to develop infrastructure or make logistical decisions, and in this case, in international contexts. Standard setting power is the ability of a state to set international technical standards. And this is a very important part as well for China, given that um, it's also part, um, uh, try to become a global technological power. And that's not only an infrastructure, it, it's also a trying to become a major power, for example, in artificial intelligence and other um, new generation technologies. So that's the infrastructure narrative um, uh, reason to have them, to, to communicate them. Now, on the other hand, the communication of Silk Road is, as I argue in the book, is utilized to conjure up a historical continuation of friendly and cooperative relations and to forge China's identity as a good neighbor, good friend, and good partner. So on the one hand, it's about um, building these relations between China and the BRI partner, um, as well as frame China's identity. And when I say good neighbor, um, that's in the metaphorical sense. So sometimes the countries clearly are neighboring China, but the Maldives is also considered as a good neighbor. Now, um, 
when it comes to the China's communication, I am, the empirical findings uh, contribute, I hope, to scholarly discussions on the BRI. Um, but I have to emphasize it's really focusing on communication. There's a lot of really great scholarship out there that, as Clay mentioned, um, meant, um, addresses lots of different questions, but I really focused on the communication part in this book. And as I said, the book is part of a, of a series and there's a lot of other great books uh, uh, coming and being published in, in the next year too. Um, in my book, I like to move on beyond arguments that China's communication is propaganda or spin or misinformation. Perhaps that, that is useful um, a, argument for others. But um, um, and clearly we could mention, yes, it is propaganda. They, they call it themselves propaganda or external publicity. But the aim actually more of this book is to analyze in detail how tri China tries to create a shared meaning of BRI projects and bilateral relations. I really was interested in this meaning making process. So how do they create that image? What kind of narratives are involved and how do they build those narratives? Now, in writing this book, I've actually um, used a lot of li different literature to help me answer these questions. And so in part, obviously, I looked at international political communication literature. Um, to explain infrastructure narratives, I draw from science and technology studies. There's some really great work there that lots of different authors that write about infrastructure. And then, of course, to explain what Silk Road narratives are and how they function, I engage with numerous historical books and literature about the Silk Road. Now, having said that, let's move on to what I mean with infrastructure narratives. Now, I see this as, um, um, as, as, as being shaped by different modalities. So as you see, there's three columns here. And on the left, you see the six type of modalities that I've been describing um, in my book as being as shaping infrastructure narratives. And um, so they're spatial, temporal, political, economic, technological, and perceptual. And so there are positive and negative ways to interpret these particular modalities, and China will try to emphasize positive things um, to boost the image and the narrative around its infrastructure projects. So to explain that, to illustrate that, the second column shows what I mean with that. So um, looking at the second column, China tries to associate in a spatial sense infrastructure with regional connectivity or with economic corridors. Um, but as you will see in the third column, any counter narratives or counter arguments will also draw on that spatial modality in their infrastructure narratives, but mention um, more negative externalities um, that arise or might arise, such as land grabbing or expansion um, motivations. Now, if we then look at the temporal sense, um, China is trying to emphasize that it's infrastructure is responsive to contemporary needs and that it's a future oriented. While its counter narratives are talking that infrastructure projects by China, some of them are, uh, they, uh, the projects are disrupted, they're postponed, they're abandoned. So instead of having this linear process of, you know, the idea, the implementation, uh, good relations, it's, it's a little bit more complex. Uh, it's not as, as, um, as, as wonderful as they try to convey. In the political sense, we see how China is emphasizing that it's inclusive, its projects, that it's in the decision-making, that the projects are demand-driven. And on the other hand, we see that, um, uh, and again, politically, it's, it's that it could be that some projects are harm on sovereignty, that it invites unchecked Chinese influence. Economically, um, China is emphasizing, you know, that with these infrastructure projects, there's this promise uh, of increased trade and logistical capacity. And on the other hand, we see underperformance and debt um, claims. In a technological sense, China um, emphasizes modernization, high standards, and obviously, again, that associates um, um, relating to that uh, aim to become a standard setting power. And on the other hand, we see uh, discussions that this BRI projects have insufficient links with other infrastructures or there's corporate espionage, et cetera. And in the perceptual sense, um, China is emphasizing and including in their videos a lot of positive user experiences where people um, say on the train are talking about the affordability or the convenience of a, of a, of a new train, a new railway. Uh, well, on the other hand, we see a lot of local fear, suspicion, accusations, environmental neglect, etc. 
Now, these are not the only um, aspects that are being communicated in China or the only narratives or uh, are counter narratives or arguments. But this is trying to give you an overview of how I conceptualize infrastructure narratives and how I try to understand and analyze Chinese communication. Now, let me illustrate this um, um, with a case study um, in the book. Um, so in part, I've looked at the Standard Gauge Railway in Kenya, which is a railway that moves between the port of Mombasa to the capital city, Nairobi, and then it moves forward more inland towards neighboring countries. Now, these are some screenshots uh, from CGTN Africa uh, from 2018. And this is um, how China wants you to understand and see um, what the SDR does or how it is um, in Kenya. And these are just a couple, obviously. <laughs> There's a lot more images. This is a, a, you know, a, a screenshot. But what I wanted to show you is like, for example, on the image left above, it shows this, you know, new modern layout. And on the, on, but then there's also images of, you know, the colonial railway, which uh, it tries to uh, juxtapose this, the, the modernization of, of, of the landscape versus what was there. Um, you see this very modern uh, railway stations. And on, on the left, on the bottom, we see this smooth railway um, on pillars that moves very smoothly across um, uh, the national parks there. And on the uh, right bottom, we see images of, we often see these where um, a, a Chinese man is instructing um, a Kenyan lady how to operate um, uh, the train. So based on that, um, I've been, um, and lots of other images, I uh, explain in the, in the book that China's communication uh, of the SGR is being made sent by uh, through an infrastructure narrative that is tailored to the specific context, to the specific project. So in many ways, infrastructure narratives are communicated for various projects, but they are tailored to the specific context uh, to make it more sen make sense for Kenya, for example. And here I explain using the six modalities how it does so. So spatially, it's about solving traffic congestion, specifically around Nairobi. Um, it's about enhancing regional connectivity, um, it's about the railway in harmony with the environment. So these are all spatial elements. In a temporal sense, it's about fast and reliable mode of transport. It's about that the railway is an improvement of the past. Politically, China is presenting itself to be a genuine partner to Kenya. Economically speaking, we see that it's about a positive impact on Kenya's trade, and that is anticipating increased um, volume of cargo trains and, that, and the profitability of the SGR. Technologically speaking, it's about replacing colonial infrastructure with innovative railway infrastructure and capacity building. In perceptual sense, it's, um, they use testimonials by local train users on the convenience and affordability of the SGR. So just to reiterate, this is what China communicates um, about the SGR on, on CGT and Africa. This is how they want you um, audiences, uh, both in Africa as well as beyond, um, given the English use, uh, and and uh, yeah, and YouTube, which is you know globally used, uh, they want this is how you would like to understand. This is how they want you to understand the SGR. But as I have been um, critically unpacking this uh, communication uh, in the book, um, it, it ignores many issues and tensions associated with these projects, um, in politically, economically, socially, and um, so in many ways the image is too pristine, too good to be true. And just to emphasize, not all issues are necessarily um, caused by China. There's also lo there, there, there's local, local, local issues that are being ignored, including corruption. So in many ways, it's, it's quite positive. And, it, and, and this is not necessarily surprising that it's positive or positive propaganda is quite often a term used to explain China's communication. And so in many ways, again, to emphasize, this is about you know, unpacking how this um, formation um, or uh, yeah, narrative formation to place. I'd like to show you another example uh, from another case study looking at the china Maldives Friendship Bridge. And this is a bridge that has been uh, built in the Maldives. It's the first cross-sea um, bridge uh, between three uh, islands, the capital island, the airport island, and another island that's been uh, created and um, where they're building a lot of housing to deal with the overcrowdedness in, in Mali, in the, in the capital city. 
and um, and this bridge has been uh, built uh, with an aid by China. So here you see some other images uh, or some images um, that are being disseminated on New China TV. And uh, this is again how China wants you to understand and uh, see um, you perceive China uh, in this particular project. And so here on the left, on the top, I um, this is uh, some imagery from the inauguration of the bridge where President Yamin from Maldives is talking how the bridge is an embodiment of the long uh, relations between the two countries. So it's not just a bridge that you know is good for transport. It's the bridge is a symbol of friendship, hence the title of the of the bridge. It's about a bridge um, making the dreams come true of the people. And so it's, it's, it's so much more than just a bridge and that's being reiterated in the communication. On the right side, uh, we have an engineer being interviewed and who's talking about you know, the challenges to build this bridge and that they overcame this and um, that this successful experience will be used for building, uh, uh, for, making, uh, for dealing with other projects um, under the umbrella of the BRI. And then further, you see obviously lots of imagery of, uh, that emphasizes the connectivity. So obviously that's very good to see uh, from above. So again, as I explained the previous uh, project, um, here again, we see how China's communication of the, of the bridge is, is uh, being communicated uh, using infrastructure narrative. But again, it's being tailored to the specific context, to the specific project. And so in the spatial sense, it's about improving transportation connectivity between the three islands. In the temporal sense, it's about reducing time travel between the islands, because before they used the ferry, which obviously took much uh, more time. Politically, it's about the celebration of friendly and cooperative uh, partnership between the countries. Economically, it's the ease of doing business between the islands. Technologically, it's about overcoming challenging environments through resilience and infrastructure innovation. And perceptually, it's about enthusiasm and joy by residents for Maldives' first ever cross-sea bridge. So all these different aspects contribute to this um, overall infrastructure narrative that I've explained in much more wording in, um, in the book. And again, this is how China wants you to understand what's happening um, with this particular project. And again, um, it ignores lots of tensions um, and issues uh, that have, uh, that have been unfolding um, during this time, including that there's been, um, uh, there's been a lot of negative sentiment associated with China, Chinese investments, um, uh, specifically associated with debt and land grabbing. And um, the 2018 election was also uh, based uh, on, on an on a anti-BRI agenda. And then it was kind of a hedging or it was like a move from a China first to an India first um, uh, for foreign policy. And that is not being communicated or in, included in any of this communication. And um, it would make sense, I guess, for a country to not mention too much of the negative aspects, but to... to, to uh, show this entire pristine um, situation is, is um, yeah, it, it, as I explained in, in the book, um, the communication becomes uh, uh, aesthetically insecure or vulnerable and it's sus um, um, subject to suspicion or fault. Now, I've, I've talked a lot about the infrastructure narratives, which is obviously uh, uh, very important for communicating about the Belt and Road. But on the other hand, um, there's the Silk Road narratives that I have also explained in quite a lot of detail in the book. So the Silk Road narratives um, I explained um, is uh, again, uh, created or shaped by various components. So part it's about um, uh, Silk Road nostalgia. Um, in, in the Chinese communication, it's about longing for the Silk Road, talking about peace, trade, friendship, connectivity. And uh, China does so by selectively using representations from the Han Tang and early Ming dynasties. Now, clearly, there's a lot of things ignored, including raiding, war, conflict, and um, um, but it uh, so that's one part of China's communication of the uh, 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 in terms of Silk Road narratives. Now, second, it um, selectively uh, uses representations of and visual representations and textual ones of people mobility. So in, in, uh, China emphasizes various uh, diplomats, um, uh, uh, Buddhists, uh, 
perhaps more known to the Western uh, uh, Western atmosphere, talking about uh, Marco Polo, Ibn Battuta from Morocco, and uh, the famous um, navigator uh, uh, Jean-Ho, um, uh, who uh, in some way personifies the Maritime Silk Road Initiative. Again, a lot of things are being ignored, such as uh, details that complicate smooth travel, um, and such including natural and uh, human hazards, the fact that most people actually didn't travel very far during the Silk Road, and if they did, often they were uh, as a cause by conflict or as a refugees, and, and not all reasons for traveling were necessarily uh, peaceful either. Now, third, I, uh, I described and discussed landscape, so uh, the overland uh, Silk Road is being visualized and communicated uh, using, you know, a caravan across the desert, you know, camels across this, you know, aesthetically um, um, a, a desert. Uh, that's how you see it quite a lot. And then on the other hand, the maritime aspect is being visualized um, uh, with uh, Zhang Ho treasure fleet at sea. Sometimes you also see maps that um, present some east-west corridors. Now, again, a lot of things are being ignored in this communication, specifically other landscapes. <laughs> the Silk Road doesn't only include um, uh, uh, deserts. Um, the difficulty of traversing uh, across these uh, spaces in terms of access to resources, um, uh, dangers that were uh, across uh, while traveling. The fact that uh, many Silk Road places are now in hotbeds of conflict and, and some are damaged. So again, it shows you this beautiful image and also it's it, it, the east-west corridors is obviously also not the only way uh, there's lots of different corridors going north and south and the idea of east and west um uh, is it was not the same back in the day so it's it's not that the silk road necessarily was from rome to to beijing for example <laughs> or xian um and then i looked at uh exchange given that china you know uh, selectively uh uses uh Aspects of that, uh, including uh, on, on culture, trade, technology, and includes things about silk, spices, porcelain, uh, about cultural exchanges, about the movement or transfer of knowledge. And so it emphasizes all these positive aspects, again, of the silk road. And again, um, a lot of uh, negative aspects um, or impact of this exchange um, are, are being ignored. Again, this is just a brief overview of how I approached understanding Silk Road narratives and how I analyze them in China's communication. Of course, there's so much more to say when it comes to the Silk Road. So let me give you an example of how that worked. So here, um, these are some uh, screenshots uh, from um, uh, the case study about Kenya. And uh, this is a video that was disseminated in 2018 on CTT in Africa. And it was to celebrate uh, the 55 years of diplomatic relations between the two countries. Now, in this video, you saw also imagery about infrastructure and about the SDR, but I wanted to specifically um, focus here on the historical imagery. And based on, you know, these four dimensions, nostalgia, people, mobility, landscape and exchanges, you see here various things coming back. So, again, it's a selective representation of the early Ming dynasty because we here we see images of the treasure fleet and uh, of uh, Zhang Ho. Um, the landscape is, is you know, the sea. Um, again, quite undistinct, it's just a sea. And then exchanges, we see the, 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 the giraffe, which um, um, was given as a present to China. And um, so here again is this selective representation of the past in, in many ways, as I described in the book, is this kind of historical check, uh, cherry picking. It's smoothing over any other issues and um, it, it creates this, you know, um, convenient story where China is saying, well, because, because we came 600 years ago to the, the coast of the um, Kenya and we came, you know, with with, with peace and um, therefore our current relations make sense. You know, it's just a perfect continuation of that time. And so that's a convenient story. You see also in, in other communications how they um, uh, ultimately create this, uh, yeah, a neat story of, yeah, th that makes sense. And obviously it is always the question, does this make sense? You know, it, would this convince anybody? And so what that this happened 600 years ago? 
And, um, and there's been, all, I've also been addressing very schoolly discussions, whether um, these voyages are not necessarily only peaceful, uh, that there are also some other perhaps more problematic uh, objective associated with these voyages, including spreading um, or uh, creating a, a Chinese world order, which obviously um, is one of the criticisms um, associated with uh, the Belt and Road. Now, this is another example uh, from my chapter uh, in Kyr uh, about Kyrgyzstan and Belt Road projects there. And, um, and here you see in writing, um, it's, it's a letter that was disseminated um, in, uh, well, also in local language, in Kyrgyzstan as well, in English um, uh, by, the, by the Chinese president. And here you see, again, this selective representation of the past. So um, there's emphasis on friendship. Uh, so again, that you know, positive association with the Silk Road. Um, it's people mobility here. They're talking about a very important uh, di diplomat, uh, uh, Zhang Qian. Um, they're talking about the Han Dynasty. It's about traveling west. It's talking about Kyrgyzstan envoys, the Tang Dynasty. Again, it's about the exchange of goods, including silk and porcelain. Um, they're talking about the great poet Li Bai. So again, it's about that cultural exchange and movement. Tang Dynasty, Unbreakable Bond. So all these positive aspects. And, in, and again, they are saying in this communication, you see how, how China is saying, you know, because all of this happened, therefore um, our collaboration now is built, uh, is, 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 um, is a continuation of the past and makes sense. Um, there's uh, some other aspects that I do like to draw your attention to a side of the Silk Road, uh, as I, um, because I <laughs> write quite a bit about it a little bit as well in the, in the book. And one, and one of that is um, I describe or call artistic charm. It's been mentioned once or twice in literature, but not in much detail. And I noticed this specifically in the video that I examined um, that was um, communicated during the 2019 Belt and Road Forum. But it wasn't only there. I've, I've been um, analyzing uh, other Belt and Road uh, documentaries where they use the same kind of uh, visual illustration as well. And artistic charm is kind of um, inciting or suggesting, um, you know, a refined China, a cultured China. It kind of draws your idea about the, the great Chinese civilization. And um, it's, it, there's the use of calligraphy, uh, a lot of poetry. Uh, paintings, uh, very colorful, and you're like, well, that sounds nice, it's beautiful, but you have to understand that this is a video that is titled The Achievements of the BRI. So you could in many ways expect, you know, images of, you know, cement and steel, of, of a bridge, of a railway, but instead they they start first, you know, setting setting a, a scene, uh, uh, the tone, the sentiment that is, uh, you know, uh, great China and culture China engaged in this. So aside of this Silk Road plus Chinese civilization aspect, I also have noticed, and that obviously depends on, on, on the cases, um, this kind of decolonization narrative or a narrative um, that about you know, a shared history um, uh, that, uh, uh, of, of oppression, of, of, um, of colonialism, or as in um, you know, uh, the, uh, the fight against colonialism. And I, I, I present you here an, an example of that. And this is uh, by a Chinese president that was um, disseminated in the Egyptian newspaper. And here we see how uh, they're explaining that, you know, China and Egypt are ancient civilizations. So here you have the civilization aspect. Then they talk about China's Han Dynasty. So that's the Silk Road. And then in modern times, they're talking about, you know, that they share that same history of the fight against colonialism and hegemony. And then they jump towards the Bandung, uh, um, uh, Bandung conference. And then it's about, you know, uh, a common cause. And we share all of this. And we, uh, we have uh, a common cause to uphold the rights and interests of developing countries. So in many ways, it's, it's jumping between historical periods. And uh, to, to make current collaboration make sound, you know, very um, compelling, right? It's a very convenient story. And it ignores many other aspects that happened uh, throughout. So just to uh, come back a little bit back from, from all these examples, in my book, I've explained in quite some detail that China's communication of the BRI is a combination of Silk Road and infrastructure narratives. But I also explained that, yes, while we see a recurrence of these narratives, they are tailored um, to the specific context of a country, of a region, 
uh, to the specific project. So they don't look the same in each place, but they are they are shaped in, in, by using the same type of model kind of modalities or representations of the past. And also explain in quite some detail that the narrative have an aesthetic function. They beautify what are otherwise mundane or perhaps you could say boring projects. Um, explain these project uh, the, this uh, Chinese communication uh, as sugar-coated media advertorials. They are aesthetically pleasing productions because they're very nice to look at, um, but they are over pristine. Um, they, they silence contentious issues that uh, negatively affect elevated economic partnerships. And this then makes the productions um, aesthetically vulnerable or insecure. And so um, I do want to stress that this is the image itself. So um, uh, yeah, these are yeah, the image itself. Now, I, I anticipate lots of questions um, that would say, well, what about how are they perceived? Now, these are, are good questions. And I've actually addressed this a little bit in the conclusion chapter. So this particular book was written uh, last year during the pandemic when there was not much option to travel. And I was also pregnant, so I didn't go anywhere. Um, but these are um, some um, research in, uh, um, avenues that would be great to look at. And um, if you are working on this or you'd be interested, do, do get in touch with me. So what would be great to look at is and learn is the, um, how um, target audiences receive and understand BRI communication. And also to understand what the impact of BRI infrastructure is on local perception of China, of Chinese migrants, Chinese tourists. Um, the kind of infrastructure projects that I've looked at are kind of economic corridors, you know. Um, so uh, they are railways, they are roads, they are ports, no, not ports, they are bridges. But it would be interesting perhaps to see, is there any differences when it comes to some nodal points like economic zones or ports or logistical hubs? And um, um, given that uh, the, the, the Belt and Road uh, Initiative, you know, expanded, um, uh, it'd be interesting to see to what extent uh, uh, the Silk Road uh, narrative is being uh, changed and adapted to accommodate these different uh, areas uh, that they try to also engage with, like Latin America, for example. So you see already that China talks about a Silk Road spirit of some kind. So it would be interesting to see um, how, the, how the narratives are shaped to other places beyond that original geography, I suppose, beyond Eurasia, um, and, and whether they are persuasive. And then I'd like to emphasize that the, the communication that I looked at, um, the cutoff date was pretty much the end of 2019. So if you're interested in the impact of the pandemic on BRI communication. That's obviously great, <laughs> very important and significant. I haven't looked at that in this book. I am developing another book and um, that hopefully, well, should be out next year in which I'm looking at it. But those that writing and conclusions uh, have not finished yet and it's not discussed in this book. Um, as um, Director Clayton already mentioned, I have been uh, writing quite a few uh uh, a bit more about the, the BRI previous uh, uh, to this particular book. And so I thought I list uh, just for your convenience, there's a lot of other chapters, uh, articles that are out, and all of them engage, um, uh, well, they explore Chinese communication of the Belt and Road. And I'm looking at various perspectives, various countries. I'm looking at central countries in, uh, like Central Asia, in, um, in the Indian Ocean region, and then um, in, uh, in, in East Africa, and, um, and particularly looking at the visual aspect of communicating um, infrastructure narratives. So this is just a, get a small overview. And so I guess that was it, my presentation. I look very much forward to um, uh, receiving your comments and trying to um, answer your questions to the best of my ability. And um, either this way or otherwise by email, if I will have to look back in the, you know, the, fine, like the fine print of the book and uh, do get in touch with me. Send me an email if, if you enjoyed this uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that presentation, for all the work that went into creating this book that is now available for all of us who are very interested in the Belt and Road, but also how China communicates about it? How does that fit with other stories that China tells about itself and about its relations? All of those sorts of things. So we've already received a number of questions from the audience. 
and we welcome more. So if you would like to submit a question, please use that Q&A button uh, on your Zoom screen and go ahead and type in your question. But let's turn first uh, to Professor Ben Lee. Ben? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Professor Bengnot, for uh, such a comprehensive take on, on this subject. I certainly drawn uh, a lot of interest from scholars uh, around the world, and certainly at Annenberg, we have um, PhD students explicitly studying um, the Belt and Road Initiative, right? And I, I really want to, you know, commend you for the breadth of your of your work, right, covering Kenya, Maldives, and um, what? How I, I'm I'm losing the pronunciation. Yeah, Kyrgyzstan, right. So this, yeah, is is you know really you're replicating essentially and extending on on I think some of our, our traditional understanding. Right, and I, I wanna I wanna um, sort of like use use this as a moment to uh, ask the first question. I feel the first question from the audience is from from uh, David Carl and asking about uh, the Zhenhe voyages to to Southeast Asia uh, in particular, and and this has a a, a specific uh, kind of moment of uh, memory for me because I I grew up in Singapore. And the standard curriculum of history, Southeast Asian history, um, in the in the early modern, let's say the, the Middle Ages or the late uh, late Middle Ages, was really about about this story. But from the perspective of of the natives, right, the perspective of the of the uh, kingdoms of Siam and, and Malaya, uh, the and and the and Java, right, and how how do they perceive and, and react to, to massive Chinese ships coming, coming down, down, down the, the straits to, to visit you, right? And so um, I remember the one very important sort of lesson was the, the concept of, of tribute, right? There's a, the Malay word is, I think, tungku mas, right? Essentially a, the gift of gold back to the emperor, Right, and, and it's very clear from the Chinese perspective that these are vassal states, right? For vassal states, even though they are, they are substantial civilization, whether in, in, in size or in military power, um, um, are, are seen as sort of vassal states. And your emphasis on, on Chinese culture being like, like the centerpiece is very much what what I think, I think from the perspective of Southeast Asian nations, they, 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 they view it, right? This is a superior, certainly larger civilization, right? So uh, David Carl's question is uh, China using the historical narratives of Chen He's voyages, selling the BRI to Southeast Asia and uh, maritime South Asia. Uh, what, uh, apart from the case in Maldives, which you, I think you really have, listed the, the complications. What, what's your sense of how successful this narrative has been to, you know, to Thailand, to um, countries in, in Southeast Asia? I know, I know for a while, for example, the, the Thais have been receiving a lot of attention, so has Malaysia, right? The, there was talk of um, uh, cutting a canal across the narrowest part of the of the, the peninsula and that that would really upset Singapore. <laughs> so what what has what is your sense of how successful this this sort of tie back to to Chen He has been? Yeah, thank you. Sure. Sure. Well in terms of the, the success of the historical narratives, I haven't really talked about the perception of the of the narrative so much in this book. I have um uh, published an article and in, in the subsequent book that I'm writing is actually Looking at this, um, you know, the success based on whether elites um, co-opt um, these historical narratives in their own communications to uh, and how they use that to justify buy into the BRI. And um, actually, so I can't, <laughs> I, I won't be able to say to all about all these other countries. But for example, in the Maldives, you see, um, uh, you, it, it was clear that communication by China was. Uh, pretty much literally copied. So there we, you, if I would look at um, particular texts, it looked like it was the Chinese writing, but actually it then it was, um, and it's always parroted, repeated 
by various figures, including, and this was President Yamin um, in, mm-hmm. in, in the Maldives. Mm-hmm. And I've seen this in various cases um, uh, where it's been uh, quite surprising um, how positive it is. And in, in, in even like not, uh, looking beyond, like for example, in Kazakhstan, the various examples, um, you, uh, when countries are fully buy into a, uh, the story, or to, to the initiative, and and they don't feel un, um, uncomfortable by repeating the narrative. They are quite successful because, it, in some ways, it, it helps these elites to just justify this uh, increased relate partnership and, and new Chinese investment. So it actually China is is just giving them the narrative blocks to say, okay, just mm-hmm. use this as mm-hmm. well. It, it sounds good. Um, yeah, so in, in various countries it works, but I wouldn't be able to say for entire Southeast Asia. It would be a very interesting thing, a comparative uh, case study to see, you know, which countries co-opted and which don't and for what reason. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and we, can, we can certainly discuss more. I have uh, certain observations to share, right? For example, in, in Malaysia, it's, it's that very complicated relationships with internally with their... their um, country's uh, racial composition, right? And so, yeah, certainly I, uh, we, we can talk more. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Clay, I think uh, we can move to the other question. Yes, uh, well, thanks for that question and thanks for the response. We definitely look forward to that ongoing research that mm-hmm. deals with uh, the reception side of it, the perception, how effective, that sort of thing. Let me turn, if I could, uh, you know, to some of the core work that you've done. And that's to look at uh, audiences, look at intentions, look at technique, tactics, uh, how, how stories are told. And so, first of all, uh, and we have a, a question in the Q&A where someone was asking about the intended audience. Uh, you know, is it a Chinese audience for internal consumption? A, is it the partner, the, the Belt and Road partner uh, nation that we're talking about, or much broader than that, trying to reach this audience, uh, including an audience that may be doubtful of, about the, the Belt and Road? So that's one question about uh, audiences. And you, you address something about intention, uh, and you've already said some things about the stories, the messages uh, that the creators want the audience to take away. And you mentioned something about the, you, the aesthetic choices uh, that people, that the creators are using. And so all of these things are quite interesting. And then one last question about technique, and that's the use of people in the Belt and Road uh, partners, right, in those countries, uh, the, where these individuals, you're talking about Chinese voices, but to what extent are the voices of people in these target locations brought in, and for what purpose? Uh, your book goes into, uh, goes into all of these things in various ways, but, and I've wrapped maybe too many questions into one, uh, <laughs> but what uh, what is the process and what techniques are employed? All right. <laughs> well, we can answer at least some of these questions um, completely. Now, when it comes to intended audience, um, well, China, um, uh, when it comes to international broadcasting, is in some way quite secretive. You, you wouldn't know necessarily everything or, for example, how much money is involved in the productions, etc. But um, when it comes to intended audience, we can deduce baby based on um, the place of dissemination, the language use, um, to what extent um, these particular uh, social media channels, uh, how, how much are they used in a particular place? And so um, if we look, for example, at the YouTube clips um, about China-Kenya relations, um, there, it is disseminated by CGT and Africa. So you would assume it's also towards the larger African audience. But I did see that actually YouTube use was not very high in the particular country. So based on that, um, 
and, and other articles that I've read about uh, from other communication schoolers that, you know, looked at, you know, the, the effect uh, or the impact of Chinese communication locally is not that high, is, is, is not so big. Um, so then uh, the, the intended audience will most likely is much broader. And given the language, language used in English, it's towards European uh, and American audiences most likely. And this is to explain actually to these audience, look, this is what we're doing um, mm -hmm. and actually uh, demonstrate, you know, the, the positive aspects, uh, the benefits of, of, of this partnership. Um, and it's not only in addition to the, the, play, the, the, the place of dissemination that it's in English, you also see, for example, uh, specifically in the case um, you know, on CTT in Africa, the use of um, and the training of, of local journalists to really uh, create a much more legitimate voice. So by having local journalists speak, you know, towards uh, audiences, they try to yeah, legitimize uh, the message. Um, and um, in terms of um, use of local voices, so yeah, it depends on, on, on which place, what project, uh, whether they use local voices. The Kenyan case, they interviewed quite a few local users on the railway and they emphasized, you know, affordability, convenience. And so I explained that within the infrastructure narrative as the perceptual aspect. So, you know, positive uh, perception, positive uh, that it's, um, you know, beneficial, this project beneficial to their lives. Um, but in other places, like in the Kyrgyzstan, um, I looked at a quite unknown BRI project, or some people actually only call it as a China-driven project. So there we see a much more, uh, you know, uh, a not a prominent BRI project, but still interesting to look at. Um, in that particular video, um, they did not use local voices, which I thought was um, uh, problematic because they talked about how great the impact was, the social and economic impact, and they only used uh, local elites to uh, verify on the anticipated economic benefit and anticipated, you know, uh, benefits to the country in terms of connectivity. And so um, whether, you know, uh, the choice of that is, is sometimes, I would say, is probably access and sometimes um, uh, maybe also language and um, yeah, proximity of people. And, and, and there's also um, in Kyrgyzstan, for example, there's been much more um, problems related to the Kyrgyzstan-China relations, in, including xenophobia has been quite prominent. So then um, actually I explained in my book that using local voices would help to communicate the message. So, um, but they didn't. So the you know the editorial choices I am I, I can't say and anything about that I can only see what the image is and um and the result of that. Right, you haven't you haven't been in interviewing these creators about <laughs> yeah. you know the decisions that went into this and so that uh, and so you're left with the product which of course is what the audience gets anyway and so mm. your analysis here is really quite useful. Um, I've got more questions, but let's go to Professor Lee. I, I think one very important question that's emerging from, from the, uh, the Q&A uh, cluster is, is uh, especially today, right, where, where the American and Western response to China's uh, ambitions is more obvious. I mean, we know about the submarines being deployed in Australia now, right? And, and, Apart from these very overtly geopolitical and, and almost military moves, what, what do you think of, of the West's response to BRI has been? And certainly, you know, we are not only uh, concerned with the American perspective. No, uh, uh, you situated in Europe, I think, I think have a more uh, nuanced sense of what, what the, um, the, the collective sort of... Um, of thinking or, or response has been to uh, China's BRI? Mm. Um, yeah, so within the West, there's been a lot of different responses towards the BRI, and it very much um, uh, that depends on, on uh, this is the book that I'm writing now, um, is about the kind of narratives that they can actually communicate to their own audiences uh, mm. to justify a buy into the to the BRI, yes. And so um, 
the geopolitical dimension is obviously quite prominent uh, aspect why in the US wouldn't buy in um, in addition to um, by associating more closely and I that that count that that um, is for both uh, uh, applicable to both the US to Europe by a closer relationship with with China in many ways um, it will be it's a tricky thing to uh, justify or explain what that means when it comes to human rights issues um, and other um, uh, to, to the Communist Party etc so how to explain a very different um, system that there's been a lot of discussion and critique about locally how would you know str stronger relations make sense so economically it can be in many ways justified but on the other hand some countries that have more problems when it comes to becoming uh, or of being a competitor when it comes to manufacturing also have has, has find it more difficult to to explain you know uh, or justify closer affiliation now in the geopolitical sense um, uh, here we see like in the case of the Maldives um, uh, the previous uh, government, did not think it was so much of a problem of, of looking east and, and working more closely uh, with China. And there's been uh, quite some critique from India as, you know, as its greater, great biggest neighbor. And, um, and normally, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's big brother there. Uh, it was it much, you know, felt very uncomfortable with that. And also the opposition in the Maldives was quite uncomfortable with, which is obviously explained with this string of pearls theory, the mm. idea that, you know, uh, building new ports and, and, you know, um, uh, uh, getting a grant for, uh, you know, a much needed a bridge that's almost a sweetener for more mm -hmm. Chinese influence and investments. And these ports can be, you know, have du dual use, both civilian and military. And so uh, depending, it's it's not only, you know, a country matter, it also depends on who's in, who's in power at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, that so that's also, you know, what the sentiment is. And over the years, there's... Um, um, uh, different responses and different perceptions of China Chinese investments, and that then affects in some countries the elections, and that then affects whether uh, China will have have has an easier uh, relationship with that country. So, I guess it's a broader answer. It's it's hard to just say you know uh, one particular place. Yeah, yeah. I was just wondering uh, uh, about, for example, Italy's case. Right? I think Italy is the the one EU member that have formally signed on to a BRI uh, mm -hmm. initiative with one of the. I think it was Trieste, the port, um, and, and a very significant sort of like site. If we if we think about the historical uh, uh, narratives associated with Trieste, and so so yeah, I'll be very. In, uh, I hope you you will spend some time. Uh, um, on, on this topic and look forward to your next your next book yeah mm. yeah no so all of these are really good questions but it's in the next book <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah yeah you've mentioned already you know the attention to ports uh trade zones this kind of thing uh that you'd like to like to be spending more time on uh to come back uh if i could uh to the aesthetics and you use mm. this term vulnerable which is mm. a very interesting term uh, for many of us. And uh, one of the questions that we got in the Q&A is the idea of cringeworthy, uh, mm. that some of these videos uh, are cringeworthy. And in some cases, they invite parody. And in some cases, they mm. have been parodied. Uh, most famously, you know, uh, with John Oliver, uh, mocking children singing about the Belt and Road on a popular show uh, here and uh, that's distributed internationally. But so you have that question about uh, vulnerability and also to the extent or, or what, to what extent do you find that these videos and these stories anticipate the counter narrative? Do they anticipate and try to preempt a counter narrative about debt or a counter narrative about some other issue? Uh, as you know, one of the one of the issues, uh, particularly in Africa, has concerned technology transfer. Uh, to what extent have uh, you know people in Kenya and elsewhere been brought into the project to acquire technology? And to be able to do this, 
you know, at home for themselves. So the big question is, uh, to what extent are, are the, is the counter narrative uh, being anticipated and addressed in this messaging? Or does it seem not to understand that these other messages, messages, competing messages exist? Mm. That's a very good question. Is the counter narrative being anticipated and is therefore, is that used as part of the production process? Um, yes, I'm quite familiar with the quite cringe worthy uh, videos. Um, before I was first thinking, oh, am I going to write about it? Like there's these videos about Belt and Road bedtime stories, but I'm like, I'm not sure if I can sell that to a publisher. <laughs> so I went to the more, you know, le legitimate videos. Um, but yes, they are cringeworthy. Um, I guess in many ways, some of the literature says, you know, we can never know intentions. Um, it's very hard. Yes, if we would do interviews with um, the editorial staff, we would know more if they're open to do that. I'm not sure necessarily if, you know, uh, if you get access, um, but it'd be great. Um, um, <laughs> it's on my list to, to hopefully do so. Um, Uh, aside of knowing whether they the intention is to um, to incite parody, I guess the whole there, there's one aspect of it that that ch Chinese media it, it does not necessarily have to be exactly looking the same like Western media or Hollywood kind of produced media. So this is also for them to you know showcase. Well, we approach media in a different way. For us, this is may maybe also aesthetically ap appealing and. And we quite know of, of Chinese communication that they don't want to, you know, critically unpack, say, the Chinese state or projects or emphasize that thing. So giving this quite a romanticized and almost childlike type of videos um, is not like it's not un unexpected. You see it in, in on other topics as well. Um, yes, it makes them vulnerable in many ways, but it depends obviously on the country and the kind of you what kind of norms and values they are um, familiar with in terms of journalism and journalism practice. So many of these videos might not make sense. And so do they expose themselves as vulnerable? I don't know. It's, yes, I explained, yeah, aesthetically it's vulnerable. They're okay, exposing themselves to parody, but you could also say maybe, you know, any, uh, is there anything, is there such thing as bad press? You know, at least it gives attention because ultimately a lot of people still don't know and haven't heard of the Belt and Road. And if a parody might introduce the Belt and Road to others might, <laughs> might not be such a bad thing. And again, it's still a parody um, where those kind of videos is not, it, I don't know, it, perhaps it takes attention away. In terms of um, uh, like issues like depth, I do know, I did write about um, as, as, um, about depth that it was communicated about in, in, mm -hmm. in the videos towards Kenya or yeah, mm -hmm. towards Kenyan um, audiences. But then they easily dismiss it, saying there was no death, there is no problem, um, it's not true, and we would never seize your property, or etc. So they instantly dismiss it. So that is being discussed actually in those videos. Um, is the counter narrative being anticipated? It's a very good question, and I will have to think a bit more about that. Um, it would be an interesting media strategy, um, because then in some way you would see. And I have been starting, you know, looking at this. Actually, I wrote to my, a friend of mine this week, you know, is this communication, is this a conversation, China communicating one thing, then, you know, you get something as a response, but not necessarily from, you know, Kenyan responses or from the Maldives. Um, I wouldn't know. Uh, I would have to look into that more. That's a very good question. Yeah, Thank just you. again, whether or not they're trying to move that off the table or hmm. in the mind of, you know, a viewer uh, trying to say this is this is how you should think about this mm. issue, uh, mm. so that you know the counter narrative doesn't doesn't stroll right in. Uh, let me turn to Ben, and I want to note that we only have a few more minutes, uh, so maybe just one or two questions. Sure. Um, let me let me sort of uh, follow up on the on both the vulnerability and the counter narrative. Points which uh, I, I think are really excellent. 
Um, and this is this is based on some of um, our our meaning Annenberg's um, adventures in China, right? We we have a uh, consulting work done for some very high level uh, uh, Chinese policy makers before uh, surrounding strategic communication, and and occasionally the topic veers into the Belt and Road, and I I if my memory serves. The, the Chinese policymakers always or often seem surprised that there's going there's a counter narrative. They're surprised that what you don't believe us, you don't believe what we just said. We are we're so sincere, mm. right? So sincere. How how can it not be? And 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 so um, it, it seemed that the, the 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 crafting of the messages. And the trans, the dissemination is very much on on the Chinese policymakers' minds, um, but the ability or the willingness to engage in a conversation is is less, right? So you know when a counter narrative emerges, they, 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 there's a, there's some there's a surprise, and then there's often like uh, taking taking offense at that, right? Like right, how unappreciated you, know, you are, so unappreciated, right? That 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 sort of um, that sort of a vibe, and and not quite that engagement so i think i think that's you know uh the the, the point in place elaboration is a really um rich area for you uh, to consider for you for your next book right mm. um the the vulnerability i want to tie in two points with uh, from from the question one is is the notion of, of vulnerability and second is is an is a is a question from the audience uh daniel Krasenstein, uh Comparing the the BRI initiative now with past previous colonial powers, right? And I think we know that one point of vulnerability is is that China is now cast as a neo colonial power, right? As opposed to to um, um, standing with with uh, its uh, colonized right uh, brethren and and mm-hmm. fight, fighting fighting uh, colonialism. So so that that charge is kind of quite obvious. Um, but Daniel's point about did past colonial powers use similar communication or propaganda techniques, right? Um, and, and I wonder if there's something useful to compare, for example, uh, Imperial Spain or, or the Dutch East Indies Company. You know, the, the, the propaganda that they use. I remember, again, right, reading, reading, um, a um, lot of a lot of references like is for example is is Chinese culture the equivalent of Catholic Christianity to in Spain right in terms of of that whether it's the aesthetics or the underlying logic or the the driving morality or uh, for for the uh, in terms of of the um, arguing right justifying this this particular sets of adventure. I think that that could be perhaps fruitful. I, I don't know, right? Um, but given, given, right, given that we, we have very well documented um, a scholarship and scholarship on, on, on just the Dutch and the, the, the Spanish and how, how the Catholic faith, right, and, and propagating the Catholic faith was such an uh, immense driving force, I, I'm, I'm feeling there's a sort, sort of a, a similarity, right? Like Chinese culture, five thousand years, right? Right, um, center of, of uh, son of heaven and all of that, right? It's just very. I, I feel like you know, this is is not just the treasure or you know the economic games. It's like this this moral imperative mm. right? um, that that uh, drives drives some of these these efforts, right? So some something something perhaps for you to consider, and 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 also eager to know your your some of your thinking on this. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. No, these are uh, excellent points. Um, definitely, uh, as we're, it would be really great to uh, do this kind of comparative studies with how other countries, um, empires did this, you know, uh, like, or yeah, the Spain and the Dutch did this in the past and, 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 and make this and, and make these comparisons. Because when I, I, I do like to emphasize, when I look here at China, it's not saying that others never had done this or um, uh, using historical narratives, clearly not. I'm just focusing here in onto China. Um, actually, I, I, um, we had with our uh, university, had, um, we had various um, workshops organized where Chinese policymakers c- came 
to my university and I've been giving workshops as well. And I've been actually teaching about the Belt and Road, They're ultimately giving similar presentations and then um, trying to explain. And yes, um, it is, um, it's been an interesting process where I've been making sure that I, I don't want to sound, yeah, this idea, you know, you don't want to offend and saying, you know, uh, we know perhaps it's meant sincere, but this is how communication can come across. And this, in this process, uh, China perhaps, you know, uh, the, the projects become vulnerable. China becomes vulnerable because you want to perhaps perceive differently. And this is not, it's not seen, and I, I explain this and, you know, uh, obviously with the help of lots of good translators, it's, it's not an attack on China. Um, uh, there's two dimensions, two aspects to that, because um, I don't know of any country that really engages in infrastructure projects that don't have any problems. Um, same, it's, it's England, Holland, America. It's not like they are flawless in their infrastructure uh, investments or projects. They just as well have problems that uh, that just come along that perhaps are not anticipated. And so um, um, engaging with that will be good. But then on the other hand, you know, uh, it is coming from this idea of publicity and it's state media, you want to present um, a very, you know, positive message that, you know, um, so why would you, I don't know how to say, like, wh wh why would you, you know, shatter your own glass? Like, why would you <laughs> undermine undermine your own communication but in many ways um i would say it would come across as much more genuine and um but that's a very scary process and it's also if that's not the kind of communication that is used in general then who is going to do that um, um and so the vulnerable is 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 perhaps the process of communication itself is the state is the projects and perhaps also the future of you know whether more uh, belt and Road uh, partners, well, whether more countries want to buy into the Belt and Road or whether they will abandon it or whether they want to renegotiate uh, Belt and Road projects in terms of financing, as we've seen. And, and so there's different aspects actually to that vulnerability, which I haven't actually discussed in quite detail in the book. But yeah, there, yeah, there's a lot of aspects to that. Yeah, for future potential partners, their calculation on whether or not they want to uh, be part of this is not going to be based on what the Chinese propaganda apparatus mm. says about it, uh, or necessarily what other uh, observers may say about it. They're going to be looking at the concrete circumstances of their needs, their perceived benefits, all of that kind of thing. But you make a very important point about if if this is your only mode, uh, if it's all good, embrace it with both hands, is your message, uh, then perhaps you won't generate credibility. And you won't then, despite whatever sincerity might be on the part of the, the speaker, you won't necessarily get an audience to buy in. And that's one of the things that's been striking to me about uh, you know, about the entire communication all regarding the Belt and Road is it's, you know, China is a propaganda state. You have a lot of moving parts, a lot of different players in this game. So we shouldn't be surprised that the product might be uneven in terms of its production values, in terms of its ability to convey a complex story well. You know, uh, so for example, you you mentioned the bedtime stories, uh, you know that that has been pretty uniformly mocked. Uh, but I've also seen some really well done documentaries. Uh, my favorite in this very well done genre is by producer Gu Jun, and it's uh, this about the Maritime Silk Road. And what they've done is play up that historical side, and they've sought to find families or communities or industries that are tied to what came long before uh, we had this label Belt and Road, the historical connections between China and these various places. And they've tried to the greatest extent possible to have these people tell the story. 
uh, you know, the director is telling the story with the shots that are chosen and all that sort of thing, but they're using those voices and those mm. individual histories. And so sometimes uh, this is really quite well done. Do you see evidence of learning is what I'm, is what my final, final question is, is do you see that, um, you know, tactics change, techniques change, that approaches are different, uh, you know, over the course of this? Uh, you know, Xi Jinping announces, uh, you know, at a couple of junctures, announces the Belt and Road. And so there have been propaganda efforts for a number of years, including at the, the two Belt and Road forums and things like that. One, you know, and you highlight uh, some of this in the book quite nicely. But have you seen learning as part of this process? And uh, this will be wrapping up our conversation. So please, please feel free to answer that question, but to also offer any other observations that you'd like to make? Sure. Um, well, it's a good question. Thank you so much about evidence of learning. Um, well, we've seen, um, say, in the, in the second Belt and Road Forum during uh, 2019, a quite uh, a more refined message where uh, Xi Jinping is talking about how the Belt and Road has to be about open, green, clean uh, projects. And, and um, it's about uh, non-corrupt, it has to be about green, so it's about sustainability, and it's about open decision-making. And so they're already starting to refine the message based on lots of um, uh, concerns and complaints and misunderstandings, as they would say, uh, throughout the years, especially also between uh, the first in the second form. So there is this kind of um, response that um, uh, that happens. So there is that learning of like, okay, this, this message is not sufficient. Um, and um, um, so, yeah, and that obviously was associated with lots of different, you know, practices. Okay, we need to improve. So it's not just saying we're going to be more uh, emphasizing green projects. They also came with a lot of uh, practices associated with that. Um, there's also been uh, trends to say, you know, maybe not every Chinese project should be labeled as a BRI project. So let's be careful with that. But that's that's came at the same time as when you're thinking, okay, maybe we shouldn't just go and delve into every country with every project. Let's let's re reconsider, you know, which projects are actually viable. Um, when you uh, mentioned these uh, videos uh, or documentaries about the Maritime Silk Road, I'm not sure if I watched those specifically, but I have to say you know, lots of videos that I look at ab about the Belt and Road are really beautiful. They are aesthetically pleasing. They're really well made. So it's not only all uh, cringe-worthy videos. Many of them are really nicely done. And um, uh, the, the news journalism is also you know, well done. So when I am critical, that doesn't mean that I try to entirely undermine and discredit their communication. Definitely not. Um, the use of um, uh, uh, local voices, obviously, uh, by either journalists or local voices that give commentaries on, on the benefits. Um, this is something that has been happening uh, for a long time. And, and it's that tactic of, you know, making the foreign use to your own benefit, you know, let them speak for you either as local voices or as journalists, because then it becomes more legitimate instead of having a Chinese presenter saying that. So that's something that has been happening uh, already, say, the last 60 years. But um, and perhaps that process of saying that there's been a lot of process of in the last 10 years of having uh, journalists from other countries come to China to get training and to learn, you know, Chinese style of journalism. Well, that is not just that one message that will spread. It's like a whole new way of seeing, okay, this is what communication can be. It's about, you know, stability of, of positive messaging. And so um, that evidence of learning is not necessarily only in the image itself, it's also in the practice behind it, but it's not necessarily only caused due to Belt and Road communication. It's, mm -hmm. it's I suppose, um, as a bigger, yeah, a bigger practice that is changing. I guess that's what I would like to say. <laughs> well, thank you for saying it. And thank you for saying it so well. Uh, it's a terrific book. Uh, readers will get 
so very much for, from it. And we want to thank you for the energy and the effort that went into creating it and for sharing uh, some of it with us in today's <laughs> webinar. Uh, we certainly, if we had more time, we'd like to go a good deal farther. So thanks, Professor Van Nort. Thanks, Professor Ben Lee. And thanks to all of you for, again, joining us. Go to our website, china.usc.edu. Make sure you hit subscribe so you're getting our newsletter and learning about all the great programs that we have coming up quite soon. Friends, we hope you have a great day. Thank you all.